Well, what's your judgment on the year 2020 so far? This is a year we will remember for the rest of our lives. In fact, I can imagine 60 years from now, my grandchildren telling their grandchildren about how they lived through and survived 2020. I was going to say 2020 has been like a roller coaster, except that would have to be the kind of roller coaster that only goes down the steepest slopes and never comes back up again. George Floyd and racial unrest, the coronavirus and all the restrictions placed on our lives, job loss, parents having to teach their children at home, the American election with its many strange twists and turns and cliffhangers. There has been a fair amount of darkness in the world this year. And because of the indiscriminate plague of COVID-19, some have said, we're all in the same boat. But that's not really true. Because for some of us, that boat is a luxury yacht. Well, for others, it's like a narrow canoe with holes poked in the side. But it is true. We are all dealing with heightened levels of anxiety and stress, missing the opportunity to visit with loved ones, and mourning the reality of a lost year of our lives. Maybe you're tuning into this online worship service 12 days before Christmas looking for a little light in the midst of what seems like unrelenting darkness. Maybe you want to believe the assertion of the prophet Isaiah who said, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. All three of today's lessons on this third Sunday of Advent, Mark read them for us, speak a word of hope. The prophet Zephaniah calls us to rejoice for the Lord is near. Isaiah proclaims the year of the Lord's favor. And the writer of the Gospel of John says, the true light that gives light to everyone is coming into the world. The word has taken on flesh and comes to dwell among us. All of them speak of a God that bridges the gap between us and the divine, reaching out to a forlorn, frightened, and despairing world. But where is their hope? Where might we find that today? Scripture asks that question of itself over and over again from the beginning in Genesis to the end in the book of Revelation. Over and over again, we are told the answer, the hope. It's not in you, and it's not in me. It's not a hope of our own invention and construction. Our only hope has to come from outside ourselves. A bridge has to be built, but we can't build it. It will be a bridge from creator to creation. It will be something not of our own devising. It will be a light coming into our darkness. It will not be a self-initiated hope, but the hope of God Almighty reaching out with life and light to those of us who occupy this embattled planet. God comes to us, and we have a name for the way in which God comes. It is called the Incarnation. And the address of the Incarnation is a forlorn little place called Bethlehem. That's where we Christians believe God first and for all time built a bridge between the human and the divine in a little backwater town called Bethlehem. I don't know if you've ever been to Bethlehem. To me, it's one of the strangest and most unappealing little places on earth. A poor place where, according to the Gospel of Luke, in a stable filled with farm animals, Mary gave birth to a son. Generations of pious believers have covered over that spot with some of the world's least attractive architecture, churches, Kind of ramshackle additions and architectural peculiarities, monasteries all clustered around, everybody, everybody trying to crowd in and get close to that place where one night Almighty God, the creator of the universe, became flesh. 
the Greek Orthodox say, we own the church of the nativity, standing over the spot in the midst of Palestinian controlled land where this church is located. This church with a dark dungeon-like interior, dusty brocades hung on oily, sooty stone walls amidst hundreds of twinkling little lights doing very little to dispel darkness and gloom. You make your way into the Church of the Nativity, going down steps, a shuffling procession of tourists and the pious into the Grotto of the Nativity, the Grotto of the Nativity, where you must stoop down into a little space, and there, embedded in the floor, you will find a 14-pointed silver star about two feet in diameter. The exact place, they claim, Jesus was born. Author Annie Dillard tells of her experience in visiting this place. When I finally made my way down into that basement and saw that 14-pointed star, she says, it almost looked like somebody had put a bullseye right there in Bethlehem so that the Lord, when he took aim, could really get to us, to be born among us. It was on a night that God stooped down and took aim and gave God's self to us in human form. Now, in fact, most biblical scholars don't believe Jesus was born in Bethlehem. They believe he was actually born in Nazareth. I've been there too, another ramshackle, out-of-the-way little town. But personally, I like to think of Jesus being born into Bethlehem. There in that spot where people crouch down, leaning in to peer at a 14-pointed silver star, where with tears in their eyes and a lump in their throat, they cross themselves and then move on having experienced a moment of joy that will last them a lifetime. To have been to the birthplace of Jesus. Now, being there myself, I've wondered. It's hard to believe God Almighty puts up with such tackiness, such utter credulous piety. But then I remind myself, of course, any God who would dare to take on our human flesh taking it all the way to the cross, is a God who's willing to put up with a lot worse from us than bad taste. The good news we affirm in the deep and resonant tones of the Gospel of John is this. The Word became flesh. The Word took on our flesh and dwelt among us. 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 We who are so very lonely, so very needy, groping our way in the darkness, fumbling for whatever tacky meaning we can find. God makes a home with us. In so many ways, we are the human race the ramshackle little town of Bethlehem, all over again. Just when the sky is most dark, and just when the sky is most empty, we look out and beyond our isolated desolation, the world we're destroying with our own destructive ways, and behold, we see a light on the horizon coming toward us, a sign, a promise of deliverance, And once again, we sing out, Come thou long-expected Jesus. All of today's scriptures, all of the church's great expectations, all our desperate hope met by these words of Zephaniah, the very last words of the very last prophet, only a few pages away from the end of the Hebrew scriptures. Sing aloud. Shout, O Israel, rejoice! Exalt with all your heart the King, the Lord, is in your midst. He will renew you in love. He will change your shame into praise, will bring you home, will gather you, will restore your fortunes. The Lord is in your midst. So here we are, worshiping God, looking for that great light to shine upon us. And what we have offered to us is the birth of a little baby to a young woman pregnant before she is married, 
And the first persons on the scene beside the smelly animals in the barn are a bunch of smelly shepherds who themselves are considered little better than thieves, outcasts, and losers. It is such an insignificant story about such an insignificant event. It doesn't make any news or headlines. There are women all over the world who have babies every day. There are women who get pregnant every day. There are smelly animals everywhere in the world. There are dirty, poor, and underprivileged people everywhere in the world who cares for one more inconsequential birth of a baby in the conditions of poverty. What difference does it make for us or for anyone at the end of this lousy, depressing year? Well, I believe there is good news. I believe that there is good news for those of us living through 2020. That God didn't enter the world of fame and fortune and money and power, position and influence. God enters the world where there is human need. God enters with the gift of love. And God doesn't exist and enter the world in the extraordinary. God enters the world in the ordinary. God doesn't the enter the world of perfection, but the world of imperfection and pain and sin and trouble. And what that says to me is simply this. We tend to focus on all the painful headlines of this world. We call it these days doom scrolling to see what terrible tragedies there are happening everywhere. But look around you. Everywhere you look, there are ordinary people who love their families, who love their friends, who offer a helping hand to others. There are literally billions of ordinary people who never make the news, the vast majority of them poor, of little value economically, fiscally, militarily, politically, or even religiously. Just ordinary people who have friends, who fall in love, who have children, who love their families, who are imperfect, who mess things up. And yet here is where God has chosen to live, dwelling among us, dwelling among us. God lives in you and in me and in all people who love their neighbors, who do good to others, who have children, who sacrifice for loved ones, who care for their parents, who work menial or ordinary jobs, or who cannot find work, who are kind to animals, who love beauty and the arts. Jesus is coming to us in poverty and obscurity. That tells us we don't have to be rich or powerful or mighty or perfect in order to receive or deserve the experience of God's love and presence with us. We, the billions of people on this earth, may see the face of God in holding a baby and giving that child love. We may see the face of God in welcoming the stranger or the refugee and offering hospitality, in offering a bowl of soup to the hungry and forgiving each other when we fail or make mistakes. Recently, I watched once again a favorite British movie called Love Actually. The theme song is a song originally sung by the Trogs, but in the movie sung by an aging rock star. I think you know the words. I feel it in my fingers. I feel it in my toes. Love is all around me, and so the feeling grows. It's a Christmas movie about a whole range of characters who love or fall in love or who want to love or who don't know how to express love. And the message is this. Love is not always neat and tidy and easy. In fact, more often than not, it's messy, awkward, and imperfect. Nonetheless, love is what makes the world go round. So despite COVID-19, racial unrest, weird elections, and slumping economies, the one thing you and I can do every day in our lives is to find someone to love. Could be a family member, could be a friend, could be a stranger or a child. In a few days, we'll wake up on December 25th 
to celebrate Christmas in whatever way we may be able to do that this year. Even though I may be separated from many of those whom I love, I am blessed and I am thankful to have my wife as a best friend, to have a brother and sisters, children and grandchildren, nieces and nephews as a part of my extended family. And even though I can't see many of them in person, I have many friends with whom I share my life, my hopes and my dreams. My experience in life is of so much love and the hope of a shining light that far outweighs the darkness, even in this crazy year of 2020. I expect it may be the same for most of you. So for today and the days leading up to Christmas, may we dwell upon thoughts of those with whom we have shared love in the past in the present, and in the future. It is in this love that God dwells. It is for this love Jesus was born, lived, and died for people who love like you and like me this year and every year, no matter how good or how bad. God lives in every family, and in every friendship, and in every place where there is love, in every loving action, in every gift given and received. So long as we wake up on Christmas morning and find someone to love, whether near to us or halfway around the world, Christmas will have come because Christ will have come in you. Let us pray. And now unto God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all praise, honor, and glory, world without end. Amen.